I'm speaking on behalf of Redmond STEM Center, which is a great program run by some excellent people. So I'm sure there's information on this channel. You should check them out. Okay. Um, so about me, I am a current junior at Eastlake High School in Lake Washington School District. And outside of doing science, I also enjoy um, baking, ballet, and classical piano and violin. Um, did the slide not change? Okay, um, I will just present it without presenter mode, I guess. Um, so just as a primer, here's my interpretation of what research is. I will warn you that it's definitely in biased in favor of physics type work. Um, but one answer okay, um, I, I think presenter mode is a little bit broken on PowerPoint right now. So we're just going to go ahead and um, present without it. But hopefully that won't change too much. So uh, if Christine, you can just continue. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you heard the first part. So as a primer, here's my interpretation of what research is, biased in favor of physics type work. Um, one, interrupting, uh, one, answering scientific questions with new knowledge. So how would I define knowledge? Um, it's a very vague term, but I would say awareness of major processes or mechanisms or drivers of scientific phenomena. For example, um, what produces the precise relationship between the masses of galaxy bulges and the black holes at their centers. Um, and also understanding systems and their interactions. So the thermodynamics hydrodynamics, gravity, and magnetic fields of galaxies, and how they all play a role in galaxy evolution. And then just generally knowing things about the world, so the kind of knowledge you would find in maybe your science class textbook. Um, my other definition for what research could be is building tools to solve real scientific problems um, using science or engineering methods. So you may not be learning much about the world. It may not be something you could put in a textbook or um, include as a great human uh, knowledge achievement, but it can do um, it can do anything from make getting knowledge easier. So if you build artificial intelligence to automatically classify supernova, so a scientist can more easily see their unique properties, um, or saving lives like biomedical devices and like the um, COVID vaccines that have been getting approved lately. So overall, it just involves trying things and thinking about problems no one has ever considered before, um, and it involves tackling science's hardest problems. Uh, where a problem is just any scientific task, um, from predicting next week's weather to figuring out the birth of the universe. So here's the necessary flex side, I guess, to establish my credibility to talk about this. Um, I've been a finalist at the International Science and Engineering Fair, which is the world's largest pre collegiate science competition, um, twice as the winner of the Central Sound region and once also as the winner of Washington State. And I was a special award recipient at ISEF 2019. Um, I've also twice been a delegate and a lifetime fellow of the American Junior Academy of Science um, this year as an emeritus member. Uh, and this was delayed due to COVID, but I was also selected to represent all of North America for MAGMA, which is an international science fair in Barcelona. And I was one of the 2020 recipients of the National Young Astronomer Award. Um, so my current research interests are like high energy phenomena, um, contact objects in gravitational waves, all of which will, um, I'll explain a little more later. Um, but it always it hasn't always been this way. Um, I've only spent the last two or three years really doing astrophysics. So let me tell you a bit about my journey. So it was a long journey to get to astrophysics. Um, in elementary school, I actually disliked science just overall until fourth or fifth grade. And I thought about studying English or some other humanities uh, subject. In middle school, I was first interested in psychology and cognitive science, um, maybe because it's more humanities adjacent, um, but I later became interested in earth science, so geology, atmospheric science, and oceans, um, which is still pretty interesting to me. I spent a lot of time also exploring different sciences as through activities in middle school, like Science Olympiad. Um, I only really fell in love with astrophysics near the end of middle school. Um, some of my friends and classmates were interested in astrophysics, um, even if they aren't still now. Um, but I was fortunate to be around highly intelligent and motivated peers who introduced me to the subject. Um, another bonus is that astronomy pictures, even though they are photoshopped, are very pretty. And so after middle school, 
um, summer of 2018, I did a summer program in astrophysics, which was kind of a crash course on the important concepts, including um, the one that eventually inspired my first research project. So the first science fairs I did were in second and third grade. Um, I did a project on how fast different colors of ice freeze, just putting food dye in water and then sticking them in my freezer. And another on whether solutions of vinegar and salt and sugar with water boil faster than pure water. Um, spoiler alert, it was not very good, but I did approximately learn how to set up an experiment. Um, believe it or not, the scientific method you learn in elementary school actually does sometimes apply to real research. Um, my first real science fair, I guess, second or third uh, science fair overall, uh, was freshman year. So I came up with the idea for my project on my own, which was inspired by some astrophysics I learned over the summer, specifically hearing about the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, or CHIME, which is an excellent telescope in collaboration exploring the sky with radio waves. So that year, I was essentially totally unmentored. I had basically no outside help other than um, some of my teachers at school and definitely no like research advisor. Um, so I had to figure out the background information, both the physics and the astronomy, as well as the techniques to work with the data, um, how to get the data I needed, and how to isolate the features I was looking for all on my own. Um, I am still very grateful I was attend able to attend ISEF. Um, it was definitely an amazing experience, uh, but it's not everything. So what I remember most about my first year doing science fairs um, was like struggling to make the project come together, and also seeing all the projects that were superior to mine at ISEF, uh, not any of the actual awards. Um, after ISIF that year, I started working on pulsars in the spring and summer of 2019. So pulsars are some of my favorite subjects. They are like zombie stars. They are made entirely of neutrons, so they're a type of neutron star. And uh, neutron stars are stars that are produced when stars that are several times heavier than our sun die. So pulsars in particular have um, pulsate in radio, which matches their rotation. And that means they are super exciting as extreme astrophysics laboratories, because by timing their pulsations, we can test our theories for gravity and for, um, we can test our theories for gravity and the nature of the universe in super high energy, um, high gravitational field environments. We observe pulsars usually with radio waves. Um, that's what I work with, but also sometimes x-rays and even visible light. So um, when I started working with pulsars, I did start doing very basic work, manually interpreting like images from a telescope and deciding if they were pulsars or some kind of man-made noise. And then I spent my summer analyzing the kinds of man-made noise the telescope picked up on, uh, aiming to hopefully advance the very tricky problem of removing that noise and finding more pulsars. So small contributions. Um, in December 2019, um, actually just over a year ago today, um, I gave my first reel, so not for a science fair or a high school event, but an actual research talk at the University of Washington as part of their quarterly undergraduate research symposium. And in doing that, I also learned how to make a better poster. Um, so if you see my uh, research posters from my freshman year project, please do not hold it against me. Um, in January 2020, I went to my first reel conference. So by some random stroke of luck, my summer work with Pulsars actually got me a grant to travel to Hawaii to join the 235th meeting of the American Astronomical Society, which is a big organization of several thousand American professional astronomers. Um, I think the statistic I heard is that there are around 10,000 professional astronomers in the United States, and there were three or 4,000 of them there in Hawaii, so tons of people. Um, but alongside my advisor from the summer, some other students, and my advisor's colleagues, um, many of which are big names in the field of radio astronomy, um, and also work on pulsars, I was able to meet tons of cool people. So I was very shy the whole time, but I listened to a bunch of research presentations, a lot of which I didn't understand. Um, I met some cool students and researchers. Actually, another ISA finalist was there, now as a freshman at Harvard. And I attended a couple workshops on tools for astronomy research. Um, I also presented my work as a poster. In February 2020, um, right before the pandemic, I went to my second real conference as part of the American Junior Academy of Science. Um, I was able to attend the meeting of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is um, a big organization that essentially goes, um, a big organization that encompasses all branches of science in the US. So it was much broader in content. Um, the talks covered everything from artificial intelligence to soil biochemistry and global health. Um, Bill Gates did unfortunately talk about the worst case scenario for coronavirus, 
Um, but those were my first real stepping stones into hearing real science, meeting real scientists. So right after all those firsts, um, we did go into lockdown. However, I was able to uh, fortunately continue my research during COVID. Um, I'm very fortunate that astrophysics research, a lot of it can be done from your computer, from the comfort of your own home. And I had been working on Zoom uh, for many months before COVID. Um, but I virtually presented my science fair project in the regional state and state fairs and also took part in um, virtual ISEF, which was a greatly reduced version of real ISEF. I also continued working on pulsars, which are, again, the rotating zombie stars over the summer. So tackling the same problem as the previous summer, uh, but this time thinking about automating machine learning pipelines to find pulsars. Um, as part of um, an undergrad research program, I also took part in many other summer research activities from uh, volunteering to teach kids about astronomy research um, to meeting other summer research students, even if it was just over Zoom. Um, at the same time during COVID, I also started attending seminars and talks of astronomy departments around the country just because they were more accessible and I didn't have to drive or fly several hours to be there. Um, I started with the UW, which I did have permission to go to, um, but I eventually ended up without permission going everywhere from Harvard and Stanford to the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics and the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics in Germany. So by, this, um, by the end of summer, I would probably heard from over 100 researchers in various institutions. And it was really a trial by fire, I would say, that forced me to learn how to speak and think the language of astronomy research, um, pick up tons of new information quickly, and also get familiar with many subfields of astronomy. Um, a lot of the talks were way above my head, designed for people that um, were faculty at universities and had spent decades in their fields. Um, so I did do a lot of Googling, a lot of uh, frantically searching through papers for answers, um, but I eventually developed a knack for being able to pick it up. At the same time, um, at the astronomy conference I went to in January, I discovered the concept of huge computer-based simulations for astronomy research, um, where you use millions of CPU hours to simulate um, parts of the universe or maybe the entire universe. So over the course of um, like from January to the summer, I went from learning about simulations to sneaking into seminars at Stanford um, to actually spending a couple months working at their Astrophysics Institute, uh, KIPAC, or the Kavli Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology, um, working on uh, simulations of the universe with dark matter. Okay, so right now, um, I guess as a whirlwind summary, I am working with one of my favorite astrophysicists. I actually discovered her work in a virtual conference in April, and now she's advising some of my work. Um, going to research talks and seminars still, and also giving some of them occasionally. Um, here is on the right, you can see a screen cap of my Zoom talk at UIUC's Supercomputing Center, and also continuing my 2020 science fair project for this year's science fair cycle, um, thinking about pulsars and uh, pulsar glitches and just generally thinking about pulsars, compact objects as always, but also trying to branch out. Um, so as part of my research story, I have uh, touched on a couple of the projects I've done, um, but I'll do a deep dive into a couple. So I will admit to making my titles maybe excessively fancy for the sake of science fairs, but I can I will break them down. So this was my freshman year ISEF project. Um, applications of helium-4, doubly forbidden singlet-triplet transitions in astronomical spectroscopy. Um, so helium-4 is a helium atom, the second lightest gas in the universe. Uh, it's called helium-4 because it has four particles or nucleons in its nucleus, two protons and two neutrons. Um, doubly forbidden. So in chemistry class, you might have learned about different energy levels for the electrons and atoms. Um, when electrons switch between those energy levels, that's an allowed transition, and everything else is forbidden. Um, singlet and triplet. So the forbidden transitions happen between two states of excited helium-4, so above the ground state, um, perihelium, which comes in one form, and orthohelium, which comes in three, so those are the singlet and the triplet. And then astronomical spectroscopy, which essentially involves splitting the light from stars and galaxies across the colors of the rainbow to study their chemistry, so specifically, you can see in, their, um, in the spectrum the different allowed and sometimes even the forbidden movements of electrons reflected in the light we see on Earth. 
So to summarize what I did in this project, I used astronomical spectroscopy um, to look for those doubly forbidden lines that helium-4 produces, uh, which happen when electrons are moving between singlet and triplet states. And I, talk, I talked about this in the context of finding cold, um, uh, very low energy helium in the interstellar medium of galaxies. Um, my project from last year, um, also for a science fair, uh, novel surveys of substructure in pulsar glitch morphology and glitching pulsar populations, also quite the title, um, but substructure essentially means uh, interesting features of the population, such as maybe multiple groups or clusters with different behavior. Um, pulsar glitch morphology, so pulsars, when they spin, can experience these things called glitches where they suddenly spin faster and then slowly go back to normal. They have this characteristic shape on the right, but of course there's plenty of variation in the shape. And then glitching pulsar populations. So I've just thought a lot about the different behaviors of pulsars that undergo glitches and their aggregate characteristics. So in this project, I did a lot of different data experiments to kind of get a better handle on the diverse behavior of glitches and the pulsars that experience them. Um, and I talked about this again in the context of the nuclear equation of state or um, what we can learn about nuclear physics from pulsars, as well as um, physical mechanisms that produce the data we get. Um, so some other stuff I've worked on, if my slide will fit. So pulsars, again, the zombie neutron stars that pulsate in radio are very hard to find. Um, the radio sky is super noisy. Uh, do, see, this is a picture of s some of the most ugly noise I've gotten. Each of these is a little burst from man-made sources. So these um, sources of noise can include things like airplanes, uh, TV or internet channels, um, microwaves, even um, the satellites um, that are being used to produce like next generation internet networks. Um, and also pulsars are very faint, so we can only see the ones in our galaxy and our galaxy's closest neighbors. To find pulsars, because of the two factors of the pulsars being super faint and also kind of rare, and um, there being a lot of noise, we've only found about 1% of the pulsars in our galaxy, and we need to look through a lot of data to find more, so it is better to automate it. Um, so I've worked on two related projects to this problem of automating pulsar searches. Um, one, understanding the characteristics of sources of noise that we see in the sky through radio telescopes just by looking at a lot of this noise data. And then also automatic, um, automating searches for special pulsars that turn on and off using artificial intelligence. So here is a pulsar I found this summer um, by doing the automated searching. And then finally, I've only recently kind of been getting into cosmology, which is the study of the birth death and evolution of the universe, so everything from the Big Bang to any of the ways that our universe could die. Um, but cosmology as a science involves thinking about the geometry of the universe, so is it flat or curved, is it expanding and how fast, and as well as the growth of structure like galaxies and clusters of galaxies, um, which involves the questions like what is the universe made of, how does um, the contents of the universe and the expansion of the universe change, how structure grows. Um, so I talked a little bit earlier about the work I did um, on dark matter simulations at Stanford, um, but what I specifically did was test the numerical convergence of simulations with dark matter, um, which take millions of CPU hours to run. So because of the nature of simulations, um, where you're trying to simulate the movements of every single particle, uh, there are a lot of approximations done to make them easier on our supercomputers, since we can't simulate every single the movements of every single atom. So I was essentially looking at whether the approximations we made were good enough. Um, and then also something I've been working on more recently is um, five years ago, we learned to measure and find signatures of merging black holes and neutron stars through listening to the variation, uh, the ripples in the fabric of the universe. Those are known as gravitational waves, and they are actual waves that go through space time, which is what our universe is made of. Um, that the detection of those waves for the first time did get the 2017 Nobel Prize. Um, but now I'm working on using these signals to probe the expansion rate and contents of the universe um, by looking for uh, merging black holes up to 10 billion years ago. So this is an idea that may not be applicable now with our kind of first generation gravitational wave searches, um, but will be applicable 10 or 20 years from now. 
So I can't say for sure that I'll be studying astrophysics forever, um, but here are my current research interests. So gravitational waves, which are those ripples in the fabric of the universe I was talking about, um, high energy phenomena, and cosmology, or the study of the universe. Um, by the way, high energy phenomena are just the most energetic explosions and collisions in the universe, um, things that go bang in the night. And cosmology, again, is the overall characteristics of the universe. So as you can see, I really do like extremes. Um, but I've made kind of a Venn diagram to show how my interests intersect. Um, there's lots of interesting work to be done within each of these fields and also where they combine from active galactic nuclei, which are the brightest light sources in the universe, uh, many of which are several billions of year old and relics of a much younger universe. Um, to multi-messenger astronomy, actually, where we associate the ripples we detect in space-time or gravitational waves with flashes of light and even particles we receive, like high-energy cosmic rays or neutrinos. And then everything that these three fields involve have to do with compact objects, which are the densest things in the universe, so black holes and neutron stars, which I've talked a bit about, and also white dwarfs. Um, I just want to say that freshman year, I didn't even know what most of these fields were, I had no idea that a lot of this research existed. Um, so research was really the fastest way I could pick up all these. Um, I am done talking about my own story now, I think. So uh, if you have any questions about the research I do about my journey, um, feel free to drop them in the Twitch chat. All right. Um, so far, I don't think I've seen any um, questions in the Twitch chat besides from Badfrost28, who says, um, all of this helium singly dupli stuff is cool, but the real question is, is Pluto a planet? Um, unfortunately, Pluto is not a planet. It's very sad. Um, but due to, um, Pluto was actually, I think, uh, Pluto was discovered much earlier than a lot of the other outer solar system bodies, um, but with the discovery of um, many, uh, with many um, other outer system bo solar bodies, um, especially dwarf planets that were comparable to Pluto, um, the IAU just made the executive decision that Pluto is no longer a planet. It's very sad. Borgo111 asks, are we alone in the universe? Um, that's also a great question. Actually, that's a question that people are trying to answer with the same um, telescopes that I used for the summer, the Green Bank Telescope, um, as well as uh, the very famous Arecibo Telescope, which unfortunately um, is being decommissioned. Um, so far, we don't have a definitive answer. My guess, my hopeful guess is no, um, but I'm not really sure when we'll find out. Great. Okay, and I'll transition to some of a couple of questions that um, some of our friends had beforehand. Um, so one of them was wondering, what is the time commitment like, especially for you over uh, high school? Um, how much time did you devote to actually researching? Um, yeah, so I think nowadays, basically any free time I have does go to working on various research projects, um, just because it's what I love to do. And um I guess I enjoy spending my time on it. Um, but the time commitment really can vary. So if you're just doing a science fair project, it can be maybe comparable to just the work of one class. I know um, Tesla STEM does um, work like that, where they have it as a class. Um, but yeah, the time commitment is really just whatever you want it to be. Um, I guess depending on how many different projects you choose to work on or how much um, you want to spend like learning the um, learning the concepts, the technical skills, the methods to do it. Right. Um, we actually got a few more questions from the chat. One person asks, how do you find these research opportunities, especially independent research? Yeah, or, so independent research, yeah. um, you, I guess you would just do it on your own if you come up with a cool idea. And honestly, I really believe that even if you don't know everything about the field, even if you can't remotely consider yourself an expert, you can still have interesting and insightful contributions. And as long as you're careful about the science, you can make a real difference. Um, but yeah, independent work is really just you come up with the idea on your own. You figure out how to execute it by looking at examples and also by using your own ingenuity. And you can contact people that can help you. Um, for opportunities that are not independent and you have a formal advisor, I can talk more about those a bit later. 
All right. Um, one last question before we move on. Um, how did you pick a topic with the right amount of scope and really decide like how much to hone in on one thing? Um, I'm assuming this is for science fairs, like coming up with a science fair project. Yeah. And honestly, I don't um, necessarily plan my science fair projects. I think generally I just um, work on like different interesting experiments I think I can do and then see if they all come together. And fortunately they do. Um, but it is good to just maybe set some um, goals for a couple of ideas you want to try. And then just um, depending on how well those go, how much time you have, you can adjust your project as you go. So in no way is it planned from the start. All right. Uh, that's great. Thank you. So if you check on the Discord, by the way, um, if you could click on the Canva presentation link that Anish sent, then we should be able to get full screen again. Okay, cool. Okay, um, how is that? Uh, that looks good. I think you can just full screen on the right and then you're good. I don't know how to skip the slide I need to go. Yeah, if you look in the bottom right, there's a full screen button. Perfect. Okay. Um, so I'm switching gears and now I'll just try to boil down everything I've learned about doing research in high school into like 10 or so slides. Um, so on the first project, I guess, the first project is the hardest. Um, but that being said, there's really no need to worry about picking the best option for a first project. Um, the best first project is the project you actually do work on that um, you think you learn from and that most importantly, you're excited to do. I would say um, this project is definitely the one with the worst learning curve, although every project has tons and tons to learn. So when you do your first research project, it's totally different than anything you've done in school before, most likely, um, where the answer is clear and where the steps you have to take are also clear. Um, so you need to figure out like your research workflow. So how do you process information? How do you come up with new ideas and what environments work best for you? And also learn how to find the information and resources you need in a timely manner. So not necessarily knowing everything or knowing um, specifically, but knowing where you need to where you can find it. So I just want to say that your first project can be both beginner friendly and valuable science. Um, it's not terribly difficult to do something no one has ever looked at before, even though that phrase sounds intimidating, um, because there's just a lot of science to be done and really not enough people to do it. So the work you do for your first project may not be super interesting. It may not be newsworthy. It may not be like the cover of nature, but it's still an amazing learning experience. Um, so for example, my first time working with simulations was actually at Stanford and the analyses I did were fairly simple, um, but I just thought it was a great way to work on my ability to design analysis pipelines, um, work with simulations and also learn more of the science behind cosmological, uh, cosmology research. And my first actual research project was that science fair project on astronomical spectroscopy. Um, indeed, the thing I was looking for was something no one had ever looked at before, um, but the project was still very low risk for me. I only had to worry about figuring out the answers I needed to the questions I had and then showing it to the science fair judges. Okay. Um, so by the nature of research, when you do a project on something, you become the expert, at least compared to the other seven or eight billion people on Earth, most of whom may have never heard of your subject. Um, 
Still, you won't know everything or even close. I would say your expertise is more about knowing how to do things and where to look for the information you need and having um, also just having thought through how to solve the problems and considered much more than the average person. Um, then being able to spit out exact facts and figures off the top of your head. So for every project, the learning curve is always steep. Um, the jargon and notation are usually very esoteric, at least in my experience uh, um, doing astrophysics, um, but you do get used to them and you eventually learn to use them yourself. Um, they are generally used for a reason not to just to be exclusive and they make communication faster and more concise for experts. So once you get the hang of them, it will make you a better scientist. Um, unfortunately, also sometimes there will be implicit or unstated information or definitions that you'll just be expected to know. I experienced this a lot when I started going to research talks. Um, that's just a consequence of being around other experts, many of whom have spent decades in the field. I would, uh, the worst thing is when everyone seems to know it, but the term is only ever used in papers and never conveniently defined in any textbooks or even any of the papers. But when you are lost, um, don't give up, ask questions, use Google and try your best to figure things out. And when in doubt, um, people, even if they're busy, are usually willing to help you. I would say still, the excitement of research outweighs all the difficulties I listed off with learning how to do it. Um, so ways to speed up the learning curve that I've um, had success with and also to pick up new research content faster is to try and surround yourself with the jargon and notation of the field. Um, so practice using it, hearing it, reading it, and reminding yourself what it means. Um, trust me when I say it will become second nature once you, once you use it enough. And then also to hear from as many scientists as possible. So going to talks, conferences, um, looking on YouTube, etc. Diverse perspectives exist in science too. I recently attended a conference on these mysterious bursts of radio light called fast radio bursts which have only been studied for the past 10 or 15 years. And the scientists there were split almost 50-50 on whether or not every verse repeats itself. So just to show you that controversies are alive and well in science and that it's good to hear opinions that are not your own or are not your advisors. Um, getting different ideas and seeing scientific disagreement happen live will also make you a better scientist, especially if you're learning to show why a reason to disagree um, for example, with climate change deniers or flat earthers is wrong. So just every other pers every perspective you hear will make you better at doing your science. I would also recommend making a habit of finding connections between work you're doing um, and other work or even other work you've done before. Maybe two procedures from totally unrelated studies are very similar or could even benefit from synergy between them. Or maybe they're very different and the difference is for a reason and understanding that reason will make you better at coming up with procedures to do your own work. At the same time, make a habit of trying to criticize everything you read, not to be mean, but to think about how you could have done it better. So one thing I like to do is I'll read the title or abstract of a paper, which is kind of a summary. I'll think about how I would have done it and then I'll read their paper and compare the methods. So just by practicing coming up with how to do work, um, how to do the research, and also um, trying to see their pitfalls, it will make your work better when you go to do it. And then finally, when you work on a new project, it is much easier to jump between related subfields, for example, different realms of astrophysics, uh, but many of the skills you get between fields are very transferable and um, interdisciplinary connections you draw will be very useful. Okay, um, so I guess here's my opinion on science fairs. Um, I did get my start in research at science fairs. So um, for people around Seattle, which I'm assuming is most of the audience, um, some big names are the Central Sound Regional Science and Engineering Fair, or CERCEF, um, the Washington State Science and Engineering Fair, and the International Science and Engineering Fair. Um, my advice on science fairs is generally to not take them too seriously. They are certainly a really good experience and a good playground for your projects. Um, you also have to make your project presentable and judgeable by a certain date, so it gives you a deadline and a place to show it off um, for those of us that have problems with procrastination. Um, but it's also like a low-risk opportunity to learn from other students and share your research and also see other students' really cool projects because a lot of the work at science fairs is actually quite excellent. Um, another benefit of science fairs is to meet a cool community. I would say maybe this is my favorite thing about science fairs, um, but I've met tons of cool people from high school science uh, competitions, both locally and also at ISEF, 
and many of them are still my good friends. Um, another factor is that you get to meet cool judges. So one of my judges from the American Junior Academy of Science um, was Pinky Nelson, who was a NASA astronaut and also a professor of astrophysics um, at Western Washington University. And most of the judges uh, have years or decades of industry and research experience that they're only too happy to share with you. So I would say go for um, go to science fairs for the community, for meeting the judges and for getting to show off your project, not, um, not for winning. Um, the prizes are cool, but the research you do will be worthwhile regardless. Also, as a caveat, um, the judging at science fairs can be fairly fickle or subjective, especially if the judges are more familiar or um, with certain people or certain uh, fields. So just knowing that your science is good is what matters. And even though winning science fairs can give you confirmation that your science is good, you should work on developing that sense of the quality of your science by yourself. Okay. Um, research internships, I think, at least um, in my opinion, are kind of a hot topic right now. They can be part of your science fair experience, or they can be totally separate, um, as they are for me. So my the, the work I do with advisors, um, like as an assistant, and the work I do for science fairs is unconnected. Um, but the general outline of how a research internship works is you meet an advisor who could be anywhere from a PhD student to a full professor. Um, you'll work on a research project that's maybe your idea, but probably theirs, or at least aligned with their research goals. Um, and that will involve doing background reading, learning technical skills, and also giving timely updates, maybe as part of a group or lab meeting if your um, advisor has a large research group, and getting science advice from them. Generally, at least in my experience, they will not hold your hand too much and mostly give science-oriented advice rather than talk about the actual technical work. So you will be expected to figure out um, how to do the actual work yourself. I would also say doing research internships is not essential to doing research in high school at all. Um, of course, if you're like doing a PhD dissertation, someone should advise it, um, but you can definitely get a good high school research experience on your own too. So general advice for succeeding if you do a research internship, um, be polite, but not over the top reverential. So just, I guess, um, just be nice to them and be professional, uh, work hard, um, try to do what they ask and then some, or at least what they ask, and make sure you communicate when you have conflicts and you can't. Um, know the science. They can teach you some, but a lot will be stuff you learn on your own through reading papers or through doing background reading. Um, the more the science you know, the more you'll be able to contribute to them. Uh, don't expect your advisor to know everything. They are more of an expert than you, and you should recognize that, but they also are still learning, and so they may not know how to do everything, especially if they are um, uh, at earlier points in their careers. Um, take advantage of opportunities they suggest and seek out your own if they don't offer you many. So your advisor can give you connections to speaking opportunities, conferences, and cool outreach events. Um, you should definitely take advantage of those. They, um, they're they suggesting them to, them to you to help you be a better scientist, and I would say they are usually very valuable. And then finally, um, programming is key. Seriously, like, Many non-computer science internships, like especially um, in physics and also kind of um, chemistry, biology, they just want you to have coding experience and curiosity and maybe a little background on the subject. But seriously, um, being able to program is really important if you want to do any kind of theoretical work. Okay, um, to have a research advisor, you do need to contact them, you need to talk to them. And you might know them or their work, but you also need to actually reach out to them. So there is also value in just talking to scientists to learn about their careers and research and not for them to advise a project um, as well. So generally, the best way to get in contact with a scientist is email. Um, don't worry if they don't respond to their emails. They are very busy. Um, but there are also some more unique ways. Um, I have a funny story, actually. I was able to meet with um, MIT professor Mark Vogelsberger, who is one of the leaders in the field of like um, hydrodynamical cosmological simulations by putting my name on a Google, um, Google spreadsheet to meet with him. Generally, if you're going to send emails to scientists you don't know, even if you do know their work, I recommend not following the generic advice you'll get online. 
So don't spam an entire department's professors asking them to give you a project and don't act like more of an expert than you are. If you are going to cold email, um, email only people whose work you know and are generally interested in. Ask for reasonable things, so access to data, access to code, consultation on a project, and just don't be annoying. So like what I've learned over the past three years is that you should keep emails really short and sweet. Don't be over the top. Um, my emails nowadays, even those research, uh, the, even those that are reaching out to potential advisors, are five to six sentences max and cover really quickly my background, technical skills, and interest in their work. When you talk to scientists, um, the occasional scientist will be a diva, so like mean to students, offended that you don't know everything about their work, etc. But most of them are very humble and kind-hearted people that only just want to further their science and the next generation of scientists. Um, so earlier I talked a little bit about the seminars and research talks I go to. Um, those are just what I consider subject matter opportunities, which are opportunities to learn about research and advancements in your field. So these can be like conferences, seminars or colloquial talks, um, also like workshops, um, hackathons or hack weeks, uh, summer schools, collaboration meetings, lecture series. Um, a lot of these things can be more student oriented as well. And I would say having access to the internet these days makes it a lot easier to find these. So some ways you can find these opportunities are mailing lists. Uh, most departments will have these for their students or faculty. Um, and some departments may even have a mailing list for people outside the department that are just interested. Um, like subject matter calendars. So the American Astronomical Society keeps an incomplete list of big astronomy events. Um, the existence of these may differ from field to field, but I, um, there are lots of great opportunities listed on publicly kept calendars. Um, Google, just looking at the kind of opportunity you want as wonders. And then social media, especially Twitter. So nowadays, many um, early career scientists like millennials and Gen Z announce everything from their latest paper to conferences they're organizing or speaking at on social media. Um, that really helps them with reach and accessibility and also makes it a lot easier to find information. Um, high school research may look good on your resume in high school, but I would say it generally should lead into continued research in college and maybe even beyond, unless you've really decided that research isn't for you. So I would say research in high school is really an opportunity to get a head start on the learning curve and technical skills for research that you'll need um, for the future. So research universities hire faculty based on their ability as researchers. So that means every university will have great people to work with. You can learn more about what they do on their various department pages. And when you do research in university, you will most likely want a formal advisor for a myriad of reasons. Um, but some ways to get involved with research in college are to be a research assistant or work on a long-term project. So that can start at any point, even as a freshman, and you'll just work on projects that support your advisor's overall research program. Um, universities may have departmental honors or like an honors thesis or senior thesis, which is a bit of research you do and then write and submit to the department. So you would usually do that as an upperclassman. Um, it can also be a four credit class. For example, at the UW, the 499 classes are research classes. And then during the summers, you can. Um, there are many ways to do research. Summers are usually the best time to do research in college. So you can be a research assistant, especially if your advisor has grant funding and can sponsor you, or take part in a research experience for undergraduates, which is an NSF funded program. Um, RUs are great. I did one last summer and they will, um, the RU sites will include many undergraduates working on cool projects and lots of other opportunities to learn about research, grad school, etc. Beyond college, um, you can do research in a PhD or master's, um, which are basically full-time research degrees and academic careers or full-time research jobs will generally require a higher research degree. So I've basically spent this entire talk talking about research, which is work that directly benefits you. Um, but I also think it's super important to take part in outreach, which is a way of paying forward all the help you've gotten from advisors, your teachers, judges, etc. So some examples of research related outreach that I've done are um, like prepping and giving research talks to students, so K through 12 and even in college, on behalf of my collaborators who work on pulsar based searches for gravitational waves, and then also teaching astronomy and research um, here, I guess, at Eastlake through clubs and throughout LWSD, um, also mentoring research projects.
Um, but the outreach you do can also be unrelated to research. Um, just having science role models is really important. So I would recommend trying to find organizations and people you can work with to pay it forward or to start your own initiative if you can't find any. Um, but your goal should really be to show what it's like to study science, do research, and generally be curious about the universe. Um, plus share some interesting tidbits from your research that can get the next generation interested. So I always talk about black holes. Um, the outreach not only benefits society as a whole, but is also gratifying, educational, and a fun break from just doing research work. So I guess some of my last words. Um, at the America, uh, the AAS meeting in January, my advisor's colleagues told me about the gift of naivete, um, which is that you are students, possibly the next generation of scientists. So the current generation generally only wants to help you learn and to not only fill their shoes, but exceed their grandest expectations and achieve the research goals that they set in their lifetimes. So because you have that gift, um, being new to the field and willing to learn, they will most likely be willing to help you, even if they are very busy. So generally, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, imposter syndrome is real, especially when you are the youngest or least qualified person in the room, whether it's like a metaphorical or actually a physical meeting room. Um, my answer to that is generic, but just know that you are there for a reason to learn and grow. And don't worry too much about being good enough for the room you're in. Everyone is there to support your contributions and to support your science and to help you be a better scientist. Um, some judges and scientists can be blunt. I know one of my judges from ICEF 2019 almost made me cry, but generally they, they, want, they still want to see you succeed even if they go about it in unconventional ways. In any kind of research communication, keep it short, keep it clear and use your discretion. So emails, presentations, posters, papers, anywhere you're talking to other scientists who are very busy, Try to, um, try to keep your content clear and short as possible. And then finally, um, and most importantly, I would research is about asking questions and every question you have is valuable, but try to answer them yourself first by testing your intuition and also by looking for um, resources or outside information. If you can't, maybe that's a new avenue to explore, um, but constantly be curious and only be satisfied when you get a satisfactory answer to your question. Um, Thank you. I, that's all I have. So um, if you have questions, you can put them in the Twitch chat again. All right. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I know personally I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone did. So we'll get straight into questions. Um, Textrex Zero asked, um, how do you get scientists to take a high schooler seriously? Um, yeah, so it like really depends on the person you're working with. Um, when I, I know when I started working at Stanford, um, my advisor told me he like, I greatly exceeded his expectations, like just in the first couple months, because he wasn't expecting very much of a high school student. Um, but I think expectate, um, like just people, um, people in research are starting to take high school students more seriously just because of increasing involvement. So I think the best you can do is that if they take a chance on you, if they like choose to take the time out of their day to help you, just do your best to meet and exceed their expectations. Great. Um, Bad Frost asked, can you learn coding on the fly, kind of like the jargon you were talking about, or should you go into your internship being very confident about coding? Um, yeah, so I learned to program on the fly. I basically, I've never had any formal Python instruction. I only picked it up through doing research. Um, I would say it is... I would say it's easier to learn to do uh, to program by doing projects for research, or if you just are interested in computer science in general, um, it is good to have some background, but either way works. Great. Um, Textrix also asked, how do you differentiate yourself against everyone who is on these mailing lists? Like, how do you convince a professor that you are the best high school high schooler to work with them? Or is there not much competition? I would say it's not really about competition. I think um, on the mailing list, they'll pro they won't be sending out like research opportunities so much as events or things you can apply to. Um, so just taking advantage of those events, learning as much as you can, and then that can all be kind of demonstrated evidence if you try to um, if you want to work with someone that you are capable of learning the content. Um, but I would say if you want to, you don't 
you shouldn't need to convince an advisor that you are the best student to work with them so much as you should be able to show them that you are capable of doing the work and capable of doing good science. Okay, cool. And last of all, um, George asks, is it ever too late to get into research? Um, no, I would say no. Actually, in my program this summer, the research experience for undergraduates, we had um, a student who spent 20 years doing um, like marketing work, actually. And then she decided to come back to college and was starting to do research and also study physics. So research is really something you can take on any point in your life. I know some people, some academics may have a superiority complex about it. Um, but really, I think just anyone can contribute to science um, if they're willing to spend the time to do it. And so it's never too late. All right, perfect. Um, I think that's all the questions. Um, thank you so much for coming out again. Is there any last thing you'd like to say to the people watching at home? Um, do research, it's really fun. <laughs> all right, great. Um, well then that's that. Thanks for coming out um, and listening to Christine's webinar. And we hope that you can come next month for um, our next webinar. See you guys.